A reading of the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind required that they should declare the cause which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its power in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more, disp more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a, a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security, such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let's, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and, when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature a right inestimable to them, and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing, with manly firmness, his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions, to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining, in the meantime, exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices, and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies, without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of, and superior to, the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution, and unacknowledged by our laws giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them, by a mock trial, from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas 
to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English law in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. For suspending our own legislatures, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here, by declaring us our, out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the work of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren or to fall themselves by their hands. He has, he has excited domestic insurrection among us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for red redress in the most humble terms, our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may, defy a, which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in our attention. Nor have we been wanting in our attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislator to ex to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured, conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and our consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, and peace friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rest restitute of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of our and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved, and that, as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine promise, pro providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Signed by Pre President John Hancock, President of the Continental Congress, not the United States. Signed by the New Hampshire delegates Josiah Bartlett, W.M. Whipple, and Matthew Thornton. From the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, and Elbridge Gary, from Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins and William Ellery, Connecticut, Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, W. M. Williams, and Oliver Wolcott. From New York, we have W. M. Floyd, Philip Livingston, Francis, Lew Francis Lewis, and Lewis Morris. From the colony of Delanair, Delaware, Caesar Rodney, George Reed, and Thomas McKean. From Maryland, Samuel Chase, W. M. Paca, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll, and from Virginia, we have George Wythe, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, T.H.S. Nelson Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, and Carter Braxton. From the Colony of North Carolina, W.M. W. M. Hooper, Joseph Hughes, and John Penn. From New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hopkinson, John Hart, and Abraham Clark. From Pennsylvania, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, 
Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, and George Ross. From the Colony of South Carolina, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Hayward Jr., Thomas Lynch Jr., and Arthur Middleton. And finally, from the Colony of Georgia, Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, and George Walton.